Okay, we're now in public session. Just before uh, we resume, uh, colleagues, mobile phones, if you could either switch them off completely or to the flight mode. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 172L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter to only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased to welcome this afternoon uh, the Irish Property Owners Association, represented by Mr Stephen Faulkner, Mr Tom O'Brien, Mr Cahill Lawler and Ms Margaret McCormack. Uh, your full submission has been circulated to, to members and, as I said, will be uh, published on the committee's website afterwards. Uh, Mr Faulkner, you're going to make an, open, an opening statement summarising uh, your submission and then I'll open it to colleagues for questions. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to, to make our presentation to you and your committee. And I would like to take the opportunity to wish you all very well in your difficult task that you have been given and in a time of turmoil in the housing sector and homelessness, it's not an easy task for you, so we wish you well in that regard. Uh, we at the Irish Property Owners Association, the representative body for landlords in the private rental sector, will give our help and cooperation to your work, if needed. You will, take, um, you will have taken our written presentation, the area in which we see the need for change to take place. With the help of government and on the ground, the cooperation of local authorities and landlords, it is high time that the state extended the hand of friendship to the providers of private rented accommodation. It must not be forgotten by government the importance of maximising home ownership. When a house is purchased, you have a mortgage on it for a period of time, following which time you have paid off the mortgage of a roof over your head. When you're a tenant, you rent for all your life, and you may have dependence on the state in time to come. Born in mind. The IPOA, I'm joined by my colleagues as you've outlined, uh, from the National Committee, Tom O'Brien and Cahill Lawler, and by our Information Mar Officer, Margaret McCormack. We were formed in 1993 as a non-profit organisation limited by guarantee, and we have been at the coal face of legislation, compliance, etc., for the years. For example, uh, we sat on the Private Residential Tenancy Commission in 1999 and the report in 2000. Uh, we are on the ad hoc board of the PRTB, now the RTB, and on the board of it, and we have served on various elements of the Residential Tenancy Board. Uh, we committed to standards and accommodation and have uh, made submissions to most of the reports published in the sector and educating our members on legislation, compliance, banking difficulties, which are many, and disputes, etc. Landlords are not the most popular sector of society, but are a vital part of the solution and constantly being levied with legislation compliance far beyond where it is necessary, all to the detriment of the supply of cost and cost of rented accommodation. It is notable that we house 700,000 people in rented accommodation, affordable accommodation, quality accommodation. There are exceptions, but the majority are affordable and uh, or have been affordable. The summary of our recommendations <clears throat> require that urgent revision of central bank lending rules are taken on board uh, because to, to leave it more uh, accessible to investors coming back into the market or coming into expending, extending their, their uh, remit in the sector. Real action, excessive high mortgages. We are paying 4.5%, maybe 5% on mortgages when uh, institutions are borrowing the money at 1% or less. We need action in that situation to, 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 to close that gap to be even more realistic for uh, return on our investments. We need mortgage relief re reinstated to 100%. We're the only sector in society in Ireland that has reduction in mortgage interest rate uh, in comparison to the, into the commercial sector as 100% and all other uh, people. So we would need that restored because it's not fair that you should be paying uh, a tax on a loss in certain circumstances and quite a lot of cases currently that is the case. Legitimate expenses need to be allowed fully. 
law to be amended to reflect the fact that the buy to let sector is a business. That is a necessity. We have been looking for that for quite a long time and it hasn't been coming forward, but we would think that it's the high time that that should be uh, brought on board. Uh, consideration should be given to the reintroduction of targeted capital allowance schemes for investment in appropriate quality housing in areas of high demand. And I mentioned there that particularly are targeted areas. And I give you an example of an area that we target in some of the constituencies of the, the deputies current year. North Circle Road, Dublin. North Circle Road, Dublin, from Hanlon's Corner, if people know it, to Phoenix Park, is an area with high density of uh, converted properties of good quality houses. There are 11 of them boarded up. 11 of them boarded up to accommodate for about 200 people. They get that on board with the local authority, working with the local authority. We mentioned this, previous ministers, on various occasions, but it needs to be activated and work with the law. The rest of the local, the rest of the North Circle Road is less hit, but is hit nonetheless. And there are a lot of properties that are not boarded up, which are out of order. So uh, a targeted <coughs> um, capital allowance scheme in that type of area, not just alone in Dublin, but throughout the country, will be a very, very um, important element of our requirements. Reduce and simplify existing legislation in the sector. Legislation that has been brought into the sector has been brought in on a whim in a lot of cases, and uh, we feel that uh, legislation needs to be, rather than um, legislation property owners out of business, legislate for them to bring to business and satisfy the demand that is there for tenants for affordable and, and uh, comfortable accommodation. Um, allow bed sits. In the, the current standards in, in rented accommodation, bed sits, which are one bedroom unit, which don't have uh, don't have bathroom facilities in in, in, in the, the, the unit, are no longer fit for occupation as per the, the legislation. And we would uh, demand that that is reversed, certainly for the for for the moment, but for the foreseeable future, because there is a lot of property, and I mentioned the North Circle Road, a lot of those houses are closed down because of the standards of that nature. Uh, we need to get those back on board, get them housed, get them filled, get them working. The HAP and the rent supplement schemes need to be re reviewed because the rent supplement scheme is paid, has been traditionally paid directly to the tenant, who is the person who qualifies for the, for the supplement, with the idea that they would pay it to the landlord. This has fallen down quite a lot of uh, situations, so we were and have been constantly demanding that uh, these, these units of accommodation or these payments are paid directly to the landlord, into the landlord's account. Because if rent isn't paid, it causes a lot of bother, it causes a lot of disputes uh, with the PRTB. Right? If it's paid and it's paid directly to the landlord, it can overcome an awful lot of difficulties in the sector. <clears throat> um, Income tax, allow for, in, for income tax, uh, exemption for income tax, long-term letting. Long-term letting, as we mentioned in our, in our submission there, we have uh, been dealing, and we have uh, leases in place to, for, for, to deal with uh, long-term renting. When I say long-term renting, multiples of four, four, eight, 12, 16 years or beyond, right? Either um, furnished or unfurnished, and if they're unfurnished, you will have a, a 20 to 25 percent reduction, or tenants will have a 20 to 25 percent reduction in their rent. They can furnish the property at their own will, the same as if they get in local authority houses, they're not furnished for it. So we would feel that that is a vital piece. We brought this again up with, with ministers and TDs and that type of thing, but to no avail. But it is an area that wants to be looked at, and it's an area that we would be very much supportive. The abolition of the proposed deposit protection scheme. We have at the moment uh, work being carried out by the Residential Tenancy Board on the deposit protection scheme. And we have always argued that there is no need for a deposit protection scheme because we have currently 324,000, I think it is, uh, units of accommodation rented with, uh, registered with the PRTB or the RTB. Uh, one, less than 1% of difficulties have arisen in regard to the deposit protection scheme. And that has reduced them. That has reduced significantly over the last number of two years or so. And the reason probably has reduced is education and training and information to our landlords who are getting abreast of all this situation. So we really see that the, this deposit protection scheme in its current form should be stopped immediately. If an alternative, there are simple alternatives of which we proposed the various committees before, and one of them would be that they have a designated bank account for landlords, where they, all deposits are lodged, similar to a solicitor, similar to accountants, similar to auctioneers, similar to insurance brokers, whatever. It might be a simple process of doing it once it's uh, governed by the PR, the RTB, or that we um, increase the, the registration of 90 euro to 95 with the PRTB or the RTB 95 and create a sum of uh, a capital sum for paying out uh, difficult cases that are not satisfied 
and then getting it back from the, the, the defender, the, the offender, let it be landlord or tenant. That would bring in 500,000 a year because it's in around 100,000, 103,000 registrations per year at five euros, 500,000 would be an, an, an ideal way of dealing with it. Rather than the amount of bureaucracy that's going on at the moment, introducing something that is not necessary for tenant or that. And the problem about it, at the end of the day, if and when it's brought in, is that if a tenant is, decides to leave today, they will not get the deposit back for months and beyond because they will have to apply with their, their property owner for the release of the funds from the, from the board. Tenants want their money back the day they're finished, and they're entitled to raise their money. So they're entitled to get their money back on the day. And what I'm saying about it, it uh, um, um, a current account, especially uh, um, for, for uh, deposits, is a simple way of doing it. Refurbishing funds um, with funding required for any refurbishing work that's done, they should be funding put in place by the local authorities, or we should be allowed to borrow money from uh, um, uh, credit unions or that type of thing for at, at a, a very small interest rate. Chairman, I could go on about this for quite a while of time, but I will leave it to you and your committee to ask any questions that uh, you feel might be relevant to the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a number of questions and then we'll revert to the committee. But I just want myself to pick up on one point you made, and when you're answering the other questions, you might refer to it in more detail. You mentioned on the North Circular Road, was it from Hamlins up to Crow Park, 11 vacant properties, and there are multiple units. Um, I'm wondering, do you have more information as to why they're vacant? Um, and that, that's the first part. And the second question that I suppose the committee would like to get to grips with, and we're not talking about uh, substandard accommodation, but there was a change made in terms of the regulations around um, bed sits, and we've probed with the Department of Social Protection and we've probed with uh, the PRTB and whatever. I suppose what I'm trying to find out is, have those regulations resulted in properties being taken out of, I suppose, rental accommodation. Um, and I suppose I'm very mindful of the fact when I'm asking the question that I do not condone or support inferior accommodation. But the balancing side of the question is we're also looking at children sleeping on mattresses, as Deputy O'Dowd said, or air beds in grossly uh, in inappropriate accommodation. So when you're looking at that balance and you're telling me there's 11 vacant properties on, on the North Circular Road, that's, I suppose, somewhat concerning. And you can address that with some of the other questions. Deputy Durkin. Yeah, just Chairman, in relation to vacant properties, yesterday it was reported that there were a quarter of a million vacant properties uh, available throughout the country. And I just wondered to what extent do they represent um, uh, sales in, 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 in transit, as it were, uh, to what extent do they um, represent um, properties that are being refurbished uh, following tenancies or awaiting new tenancy? And is there some other reason as to, as to why there might be uh, a large number of, of properties vacant throughout the country? Or is it, is it just that it's, it's been tossed out as a, a, an indicator that there isn't really a housing problem at all? that there isn't a housing crisis at all, that here we have 250,000 uh, uh, properties that are available for, for, for tenancies, and so why do we have a housing crisis? Uh, can I ask also, <clears throat> in relation to the 4.5% the interest rate uh, uh, that you have to pay for, for, for uh, um, capital um, costs in relation to, to purchasing, uh, uh, how does that, um, um, how did the, the, the first time house buyer for example, how does the first time house buyer and yourselves compete on the market? Uh, for instance, does the first time house buyer have any chance? Uh, do, is the first time house buyer priced out of the market? Uh, are there instances where the first time house buyer and yourselves are uh, competing for the same market at the same time in the same place? Uh, and, and what happens there? The other thing, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't hate repeating myself in this business, but uh, uh, the. the, the, the um, Anyway. You might see you might see yourselves as part of the solution, and the, and the jury is still out of this. I, I, I don't see the, the rental market as being part of the solution. In fact, I see it as being part of the problem. And not blaming the, 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 the property uh, owners association, but simply because, in lieu of uh, what was previously a reliable system of local authority housing, the private rental system was 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 purported to be the answer to the problem in the future. Now, with the privatisation uh, of of that sector, 
I don't think it worked. I predicted that it wouldn't work at the time, and I'm not going to go into that, the details of that now, but there still remains the problem. And uh, uh, for instance, do you accept that there is now an urgent need for the local authorities to become directly involved in the provision of local authority houses in two ways? One, direct building, two, local authority loans which was the, the, the bedrock of what the initial first-time house buyer had to rely on in the past, and that included public officials, nurses, guardy, teachers, initial housing, that's where they went for their loans, and it was, it, it was well. And some, many of the people stayed in the same houses for their lifetimes or for quite a long time. And the other question that I, I want to raise, the, 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 the extent to which you, and I, I want to say this, Chairman, there is a difference between responsible landlords and irresponsible landlords. There's a difference between the people who are in the market to make a quick book and the people who are in the market to provide an ongoing long-term service. So I, I, I take that point. But how do you respond to the situations whereby rent increases in a well in excess of inflation, even housing inflation, are demanded by some landlords on a fairly regular basis? And what, to, to what extent do they take advantage of the situation where you're only allowed a rent increase uh, once every two years, that they, the rent increase in that situation could well be 100%? And I've, I've dealt with situations like that. I'm sure everybody else here has as well. Uh, how do you deal with that? It's, it certainly isn't a, isn't a, a, a PR effort that would be of any benefit to the Property Owners Association. And the question about the refund of the deposit, again, the same would apply. The responsible property owner, I think, is willing to, to, to do the right thing. 